Okay, amazing. Maybe then uh, I, I made a short intro about you in, in two sentences, but I'm, I'm sure there's much, much more about the story of Carter. So why don't you tell us from yourself how you how you came up with Carter, how it started out back in, I think, 2012, and uh, a little bit about the path until where you're now. Yes, totally. So we started, um, you know, we incorporated in 2012. We launched in January of 2014. The original idea for Carta was to build a, uh, what we called at the time, the NASDAQ for private markets. So we wanted to build the, the, the stock exchange of the marketplace for, for private stock. And our, you know, we weren't the first company to, to think of this idea. There's been many attempts at trying to build liquidity in the private uh, markets. Um, our, our angle or what we thought was unique for us was uh, to, to, to earn the right to build that marketplace. We had to own the cap tables first because you had to be able to do settlement um, uh, and transfer, right? Everybody else, there were sort of cap tables on one side, you know, that were managed by hand and manually and through paperwork. And then they were trying to build marketplaces on top of that where they would match buyer and buyers and sellers uh, on the marketplace. But then to actually execute the transaction, you had to go to the lawyers and you had to do the paperwork and you had 30 day rofer. And there was all this, this transactional overhead, this cost. Uh, I liked what, what, uh, James was saying was, you know, finding marketplaces that don't exist today uh, and finding transactions that aren't happening and making them happen. And our thesis back in 2014 was um, the reason why market, uh, private, private markets don't exist as a liquid market is in part because of the friction around doing these transactions. And we would use software uh, by owning the cap table. We could then make these transactions happen, you know, instantly, right? You just flip the database uh, column or, or row and, and change it. Uh, and so, uh, so we started with cap tables in 2014 uh, with the idea that we would aggregate all the cap tables together. We would then know who owns what. We'd have all the shareholders on the platform. We'd have the companies on the platform. We would converge the network uh, and then we could add liquidity uh, to it. You know, fast forward, you know, eight years uh, to 2022, we're still working on the liquidity problem. It's a really hard problem. I'm, you know, this, there's a lot of experts on how to build marketplaces here. I'm the expert on how not to. So I'll tell you all the all the things not to do to build a marketplace. Um, but we're about 2,000 employees. We're about 300 million in, in, in ARR. Um, about 60% of that comes out of our core cap table business. Another 30% comes out of our fund administration business and 10% is sort of uh, new, new stuff we're working on. Uh, and then we, last year we did about 20 million in revenue on our marketplace. You know, this year it'll be, it'll be probably, you know, half, uh, half of that or so just with the markets. Uh, you know, it's a very volatile uh, uh, market. Um, but then hopefully next year we'll we'll start growing again on the marketplace. Amazing. If you already that you mentioned that uh, maybe in case of top five, you make kind of how on the marketplace particular points where you said that's something I would have done different, or that's where I learned kind of my lesson in terms of building marketplaces. Yeah, so I think James really um, uh, said it well about creating transactions that don't exist. My my <laughs> framing of that is that um, all marketplaces emerge um, uh, in sort of two steps uh, uh, or, or two two conditions have to be true. So one is that there's uh, implicit embedded demand uh, that doesn't that's not being filled today that nobody can see because by definition it's it's not being filled yet. This demand exists, but nobody can see it yet except for the founder. Uh, and then that the founder has figured out a way to unlock supply. Uh, and those are the two conditions that you need to get the marketplace going. And so, you know, the classic example, of course, is Airbnb. The founders believe there was implicit de demand to sleep on other people's couches. Nobody else believed them. Nobody thought people would sleep on other people's couches, but they did. Uh, and then they figured out a way to get uh, people with couches to open up their doors and allow people to sleep on them. And, and that was, that was what, what created it. Uh, or, or started the marketplace. And so, you know, when you think about um, how to build a marketplace, I, I think everybody has to have that framework. Like what's the implicit demand that, that doesn't, that isn't being served today that nobody else sees that I see. And then how do I, how do I unlock supply into that demand? And then I, I think that's the strategic question. I think the tactical question becomes, well, okay, how do you do matchmaking uh, and pricing? Uh, at least in every market is unique. So it's like super interesting. Like you can study like like kidney markets, um, uh, which which is which is a very unique marketplace when they when they do health you know mar kidneys there's no price pricing on kidneys the hard part of, 
of kidneys of kidney marketplaces is the matchmaking. You're not allowed to sell kidneys in the United States, but you can matchmake and you got to find the right kidney for the right person in the right moment of time because the, the survival rate of, of these kidneys is only a few days. You, you have to get it into the person quickly. And so that's a very unique market. Ours is a very unique market. Uh, in the sense that there's a lot of restrictions on who can buy, who can sell. So, so it's similar to a kidney market in, in the sense that you have to match the right buyer and seller. It's not, it's not fungible. All buyers and sellers aren't fungible. But we also have a pricing problem where in kidney markets, there, at least in the United States, there is no pricing problem. You can't pay for a kidney. And how do you, how do, you do pricing is a whole other kind of part of the marketplace is that you have to converge the pricing to get the match to happen. And price discovery in marketplaces is a, is a, is a very challenging, difficult problem. And every market is kind of unique uh, in how they do that. Mm -hmm. Super, super interesting. If I'm not mistaken, you launched Carta X in 2021, right? So that's a, that's a secondary transaction marketplace for yeah, stock options or stock you own in companies. I would love to hear which dynamic you currently experience, especially in the tech downturn. I think many employees are potentially afraid that their ESA won't be worth anything anymore, maybe in two years. Um, what's, the, what's the dynamic you see at the moment? Is there over, over kind of supply or, or are you riding a wave with Carta X? How, how did it yeah, change since the implementation last year? Yeah, sure. So we, um, so if you saw sort of 2021, we were a very demand constrained market, uh, or sorry, um, supply constrained market. There was a lot of demand, a lot of investment and appetite, uh, uh, and there weren't enough sellers, particularly, uh, you know, sellers were kind of holding out and holding on. Um, and then now we're in, in the inverse. So we're oversupplied market, demand um, constrained market, there's not enough buyers. Uh, and what's sort of happening is, You know, public markets can adjust really quickly to price changes, as, as we all know, as they very quickly uh, uh, discount stock. Uh, private markets are slower. Uh, and sort of the traditional rule of sl uh, thumb is, you know, it's like private markets sort of trail pub public market valuations by three or three to six months. Uh, this is actually seems to be longer than the average because uh, I think you're seeing a couple of things. So there's two, two different markets in the private markets. There's the primary market and then the secondary market. And you're seeing the primary market, at least in early stage, is able to reset really quickly. Um, and so you're seeing seed stage and early stage valuations come down. You're not seeing growth stage valuations come down in the primary markets. And the reason is that in the private markets, there's this thing you know well, which is the uh, anti-dilution uh, provisions. And so anytime these companies that raise uh, uh, institutional capital, you know, series A, B, C, D, They have, they have ratchets, they have anti-dilution, so that if they raise a lower round, it disproportionately punishes the common shareholders. You know, the, the early investors get, get uh, anti-dilution protection on down rounds. And so there's a lot of, lot of you know, in, in a public market, it's all common. So it can just go up and down and everybody gets reduced the same amount. In the private markets, uh, because of anti-dilution, it's extremely punitive to common shareholders to, to, to go down, uh, to do a down round. And so you're seeing a lot of holding out. Uh, by late stage companies from from resetting price because they don't want to trigger anti-dilution. What's starting to emerge in the late stage companies is um, structured notes. So the the investors will will uh, uh, you know honor the the last price you know even though they know it's overpaid, but they will put in ratchets and other things to protect them, particularly on IPO where they get discounts uh, on IPO. So you're seeing more structured uh, uh, rounds starting to happen, and I think that will continue. But definitely late stage is having a hard time adjusting uh, to the new new pricing um, regime. In the secondary markets, it is, it is a little bit different because you have individual sellers as opposed to CEOs uh, that are uh, protecting the cap table. You have individual sellers that are selling. And the bid ask spreads between what investors are willing to pay, which is often a 50% discount you know, to the last round, and what sellers are willing to sell at, which is they still are trying to hold on to the last round pricing. That's the true value. Um, uh, it is really big and the, the market has not, has not converged yet. Um, uh, to, to make this market start getting more liquidity, you'll have to see sellers start to capitulate uh, and take discounts on the last round. And that hasn't started happening yet, but my guess is over the next six months, you'll start to see that convergence happen. Thank you very much. Super interesting. And um, I would have one further questions re question regarding scalability. Um, If I'm not mistaken, or maybe I'm wrong here as well, but like what kind of aspect does regulation in, in each market on, on kind of stock option, Germany, for example, 
is, is an, still a nightmare in terms of taxation and so on. And I, I can assume that transfer of shares and stock option rights and the correct tracking can be a nightmare as well in, in scaling a company. So um, how did you decide which markets you're entering? How kind of hands-on does your product team need to be here? And, and how easy is it to scale a, a product like Carter? Yeah, so... You know, one of the, the the kind of insights that we had in the early days is, hey, all of the economic and um, structure, capital structure information that's embedded in these financing documents, uh, we can translate to, to numbers. Like we can capture all this economic mm -hmm. information and, and put it as structured data. Um, and that was the big, the big insight that created cap table software, um, uh, which now seems kind of, you know, obvious but back then you know nobody thought you could pull extract all this stuff out of uh, legal documents and, and structure the data and so now all of this is structured and so being able to to structure this information allows us to to quickly move transfer shares move shares you know match shares you know buy shares so we can do all of this stuff there's this sort of secondary part which is um you know what's the regulatory regime that now manages uh, this right because before the regulatory regime was just contract law um, you know, we um, uh, lawyers would would do deals uh, or, you know, investors and companies would do deals. Lawyers would document all this stuff. And then if anything went wrong, you, you went to court. And uh, now that it's becoming more structured and becoming uh, the, the ecosystem is maturing now, you know, SEC type regulatory provisions start to, to come into play. Um, and we're seeing this. And so we work a lot with the SEC. Uh, we're we're a, a registered broker dealer. We're a registered alternative trading system. Um, uh, we talk to them once a week about what's going on. And the good news is that the SEC has long looked at the private markets as sort of this black box of like, you know, they don't really know what's going on there, but they're so busy on the public markets and private markets, you know, historically have been so small, nobody really cared about it. And now it's big enough that people are starting to care. A lot of employees, you know, have a lot of um, value captured in private companies. And so the SEC is getting more involved. Mary Jo White, before she ended her tenure, actually came to Silicon Valley and said, we're, we're going to look at Silicon Valley. Like, we're very interested uh, in this. And then obviously with the administrative change, there's been a little bit of a slowdown, but they're going to come back. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what we've been working with the SEC on is, hey, there's there's so much uh, opacity uh, in, the public, in the private markets because it's all captured in, in sort of legal, confidential legal paperwork. And what we're doing at Carta is we're kind of making we're making this more transparent. We're bringing all this stuff into an open marketplace with buyers and sellers. It's that's regulated through an ATS that you can actually look at transactions. You can audit transactions. You can make sure everybody who's participating has information rights, has, has been KYC and AML. You can do all of these things that you do in the public world. You can now do in the private, which you couldn't do before Carta. Uh, and that's our pitch to the SEC to help us figure out how to how to structure uh, uh, and mature this market. Really interesting. I recently read that you made an acquisition in the UK. I think you've you've bought Capdesk, and this uh, this smells for me like a, maybe a market entry closer closer to to Europe. Maybe could you could you share what what's next for Carta? What's kind of if you have to envision the next two to three years? I mean, also given now with potentially upcoming on Europe, we have already the recession. And um, what's what's next? What what are your big plans for, for the near future? Yeah, so we're super excited about Europe. You know, we've spent the last eight years, you know, uh, focus on the United States. Uh, and then last year, uh, you know, I'll, I'll remember the Q3 board meeting or Q4 board meeting where, you know, they said, uh, you know, hey, we should really, you know, start thinking more globally. Because the vision for Carta has always been, to unite global capital uh, through the private markets. You know, we could build, we used to call it the NASDAQ for private markets when our ambitions were just domestic, but now that our ambitions have grown and the company has grown, it's really, can can a company in the UK access US investors, you know, uh, and vice versa? Can a US company access UK investors? You know, it's kind of this sort of this funny thing where um, in the public, because of the, the way regulation works for public markets, by definition, a public stock market uh, has to be regional. Right. I can't buy stock on the London Stock Exchange and um, uh, 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 unless I go through ADRs and all this weird stuff, because all these things are regulated by country. But a private stock mm -hmm. market, because it's it's all contract law, uh, it, it's cross border. Uh, and so you can imagine a private stock market could be global. Investors could participate from any region. It doesn't it doesn't matter which country uh, you're in. 
And so we've had this global ambition and we said we should start in the UK. Uh, and so we looked in, in, in Europe and UK looking for the best sort of cap table company that we could find um, because we don't know the, the local regulation. This is all, all new to us. We're experts in the US, but not, but not in Europe. So could we find an a entrepreneur, a team that's working on this problem in, in, in Europe? Uh, and we kind of talked to all the best companies out there, um, the, the Carta for Europe, the Carta for UK. Uh, and obviously we found CapDesk. We fell in love with the product uh, and the team there. Um, uh, and then we ended up um, acquiring them a, a few months ago uh, this summer. Um, and they're really starting to grow out our cap table business in Europe. Uh, they also have a secondaries business as well. Uh, and the idea is that we can now unite these things uh, from a liquidity um, on, a, on a combined liquidity platform. Maybe on that point, what would be your advice to founders in, in markets which are kind of high, higher regulated than the average, right? I mean, you're in, in the end playing in also in financial markets a bit. So what's your, what's your advice for collaboration with regulators? Is it better to kind of do something and then ask for forgiveness or why or better to ask for permission and what's your what's your take on that what's what's your personal experience yeah so i think um it's a great question and i, I think um my view uh is um if you ask for permission you'll never get going so you, you can you, you can't take that 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 view i, I think it's an uh, any any founder has to be in the ask for forgiveness uh mode at the early stages You know, at, at our stage where you, you actually have assets, you know, to value, you, you do want to be more ask for permission, right? <laughs> Because you don't, you know, we're, we're, you know, our last round, we did an 8 billion bucks for 300 million revenue. Like we have real value that we've created. We don't want to get shut down. Uh, but, but if you're just starting out, right, the, the, the risk is not that you get shut down. The risk is that you never get off the ground. And so if you're early stage, uh, you do, you just have to ask for forgiveness, not permission. And that's where all this stuff happens, right? Is is all this, new, whenever you're in regulated markets, uh, sometimes it's, you know, a startup is an arbitrage on sort of what could be and what what is, and the founder is able to bridge that gap of what could be and what is, um, uh, and that arbitrage. In regulated markets, it's both what could be and what is, but there's also sort of by definition a regulatory arbitrage where you, you see a gap in the regulation that other people don't see that, you, that you're willing to take, take a risk on and go for. Uh, you know, Uber, Classic example, right? Taxi cabs, right? It was a regulated market, but they saw a gap in it. And they're like, let's give it a shot and see what happens. You know, even PayPal, historically, you know, PayPal is the most extreme version of this, where they broke every banking rule uh, that existed at the time. But they, they just got so big so fast. By the time the regulators caught up, they were too big to fail. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and you, they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, you know, I would say Bitcoin is the same, right? Um, I talked to a former SEC commissioner or chairman the other day. Uh, and I said, hey, what happened with Bitcoin? You guys, you guys locked down uh, all the ICOs. You know, you, you figure you, you did all that stuff. Um, but what happened to Bitcoin? How did you let that get, you know, uh, uh, out of Pandora's box? And he goes, it just happened too quick. We couldn't respond fast enough. Uh, and so so I do think there's like this regulatory arbitrage that people uh, have to have to have to think through. Um, but it's very much you have to move fast. You have to find the gap the seam, you know, uh, the gap in the regulations that allows you to sprout where everybody else is too afraid uh, to try. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally understand. Maybe going back to the very, very early days of Carta, I was wondering how you set up the team to translate law into tech. You said earlier you, you realized that you can kind of translate every law into a number. And what was the composition of this, this product or tech team? Like, how did you find the right people here? How, how was the process to identify what you actually need in the first version, what you can leave out? If you remember, and if you think this is still valuable today, I would love to hear it. Yeah, sure. So we have a very, um, uh, uh, you know, the previous um, uh, Uh, person that you were talking to is talking about sort of like Flexport and all these marketplaces where you have to deeply understand the market structure. And what's what's tough about Carta is we're different than than a lot of Silicon Valley companies, where a lot of Silicon Valley companies, you know, it's like photo sharing. It's like you don't need domain knowledge to do it. Like you're you're trying to do something that anybody can wrap their hands around. Uh, you know, the the knowledge and it's it's about building something new and unique and all those things. But like the domain knowledge is is secondary. We're in a business where domain knowledge matters a lot. Uh, and so when you built the early team, 
we, we had a combination of engineers that were interested in learning about financial technology and contracts and, you know, private markets. And then we hired business people that came from this industry. So like one of our first business hires was actually a lawyer, a corporate lawyer that did, you know, transactions that did a lot of series A's, a lot of series B's also did employee, you know, option plans. Um, and you put them together and they work together and the, the business people taught the engineers and we we're very lucky. We weren't the first cap table company, uh, but not by a long shot. Um, uh, uh, so we, we hired people who came from other cap table companies and they, they brought specialized knowledge on, on how to do all these things. So, uh, and then if you fast forward, you know, that was the early team that hasn't changed. If you look at Carta today, we have, uh, you know, we're in a, we're in a bunch of different industries now we're in private market cap tables. So we're in fund, fund administration and accounting. We're in public markets. We have a whole public market business where we do public uh, equity plan administration. We do private equity uh, now. We do compensation um, uh, benchmarking now. So we do all these different things and we hire experts from all these different industries and we pair them with product and engineering teams uh, that learn you know, uh, uh, from, from these experts in the industries and we continue to build that way. And so if you look across Carta, you know, out of, out of 2000 people, about five, 600 are uh, in product and engineering. Uh, and another 500, I would say, are like domain experts. They're like fund accountants. They're, you know, cap table experts. They're compensation experts. Um, uh, and that's, that's always been, been, been true of us. Cool. No, super, super nice. Maybe one question about crisis at Carta, right? I mean, uh, we all know entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. If you want to share, like, what, what was the biggest crisis you, you had while building Carta? Was there a moment where you thought, like, okay, we are going belly up? And, and how did you manage to stay positive and, and escape it? Yeah, well, so there's lots of uh, different types of, you know, uh, crisis. And so there's everything from, like, you know, um, we had an existential crisis in 2017 or 16 where we had to change our business model. You know, so at the very beginning... Um, we were issuing stock certificates uh, uh, and we were charging $20 per stock certificate that we were issuing, you know, and our, our competition was FedEx. We would tell companies, Hey, instead of, you know, it, it sounds quaint today. It sounds crazy. But back in 2014, everybody got a paper stock certificate in FedEx. That was like how you prove ownership of your company. And we were like, Hey, don't pay FedEx, you know, and a, and a paralegal to print and mail the stock certificate. Like we'll just send it over email and pay us $20. Uh, and that was our, our pitch. And what we realized is that's actually a, a terrible business model. You know, it's transactional, it's volatile, it's hard to predict. And we wanted to move everybody to a, um, a, a subscription model. So instead of paying $20 a certificate, we wanted you to pay us 2000 bucks a year. And that, that was it. And you could issue as many stock certificates as you can. And we're like, how are we going to do this? Like, we knew we were going to go out of business if we didn't change to a recurring SaaS business. But we had already signed up hundreds at that point, maybe a thousand customers that, you know, agreed to, to this $20 thing. And um, uh, it's one of my favorite stories about Carta is that, or for, for, for founders about Carta is that sometimes the business model you start with isn't the business model you end, end up with. And how we did the transition was we were just really honest with our, our customers. Uh, I sent them an email from me explaining, hey, I made a mistake. Uh, that $20 stock certificate thing isn't going to work. Like, I won't be able to stay in business and continue to serve you. Uh, if I do that, I need to move you to an annual billing uh, 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 system. I totally understand if, if you are angry and decide to leave because I made this change, but I have to make this change. Uh, and so I'm moving you, you know, based on this number of, you know, line item, you know, stakeholders in your cap table, I'm moving you to $2,000 a year instead of $20 to stock certificate. And we're just expecting, you know, massive blowback, blowback. And what was amazing was we had some customers that were upset, but the vast majority sent me emails saying, um, you know, I'm so glad you did this because I was worried about you. I didn't, I wasn't sure how you were going to make money. You know, uh, we're, we're, I don't want you to go out of business. You have our cap table. Uh, and so, uh, so thank God you got smart enough to, to change, to change pricing and we're happy to pay. Uh, and it was, it was incredible. And we were on the phone talking to customers, explaining ourselves for, for, you know, weeks, uh, as we talked to everybody and explain, you know, and it's harder to do now we have 30,000 customers. It's harder to do that at scale. Um, but but that's like an example of the early days of, of, of crisis and how we kind of figured our way out of it. 
Super, super interesting. And then what I was wondering, as you mentioned earlier, you're also now in private equity, compensation, benchmarking. How do you decide as a company to enter a new field? I mean, because, for example, HR comp or compensation benchmarking alone is a huge field with probably multiple unicorns <laughs> operating in that, that field. So so how, how do you make decisions on whether to enter? So we talked about enter which geography, but like also about which kind of sector is next. Yeah, it's a great question. And we, we think about this, this a lot. Um, and we actually have a framework. We have a whole like um, set of uh, 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 criteria uh, that we, we use to evaluate, like, should we enter a new market or, or shouldn't we? Um, uh, the number one um, uh, criteria for us is that we have what we call edge in that market. You know, most people think about tangentialness. So they think like, I, you know, I, I'm in this market, there's a, a tangential market close by, I should like incrementally move into that new market. Um, the problem with tangentialness is a lot of times markets um, aren't tangential, but can be combined. Like you can pull them together, but you can't see it before the fact. And the, the classic example for us is cap tables. And in the US, we have this thing called 49A valuation, which is uh, valuing the, co the company for stock options to set the exercise price. And in 2014, the cap table market was a, a lawyer's market. Your lawyer managed the cap table for you. And then you had this cottage industry of 49A valuation analysts that were completely separate from the lawyers that did the 49A valuation. So you got your cap table from your, your lawyer, and then you went to the valuation analysts or valuation firms to get your 49A. And they weren't tangential at all. But we looked at these two markets um, and said, oh, the 49A valuation uh, is dependent on the cap table because the way they model these 49A valuations or model the, the value of the business is they basically do some math on top of the capital structure of the business. So they take the cap table, they put it in a spreadsheet, they do some fancy math and out comes a valuation. And, um, and we knew this because we had all the cap tables and then all our customers were saying, hey, can you send my cap table to my valuation analyst so that they could you know, do the, the valuation? And we were realizing they were paying the valuation people more than they were paying us. And we said, well, hey, it's just math on the cap table. Maybe we can build our own valuation on top of it. And then they don't have to go somewhere else. They can just get it in one place. And that business just took off. Uh, it exploded once we got it going. And um, the, the moral of that story is, and, and if you look today, uh, today you can't be a cap table. You know, there's lots of competition. There's lots of cap table providers. Um, but today you can't be a cap table software provider without doing four and a valuations and you can't be a valuation a standalone valuation shop without doing cap tables like those will forever be integrated uh and um uh but they weren't uh and and now they're considered tangential but you couldn't see that beforehand and so whenever we look at a market like whether it's compensation benchmarking compensation benchmarking and cap tables don't go together like they don't it doesn't make sense but the reason we got into benchmarking is we're sitting here and we're like, we have all the equity data uh, for companies and how much they pay employees and equity. And we have all the salary data because we integrate with the HRIS payroll systems. Uh, and so why don't we just aggregate this stuff and benchmark it for our companies? Uh, because we have edge in this market. We can do this uniquely better than anybody else. Just like with cap table software, we could you know, do 49A better, faster, cheaper than any, any valuation shop that didn't have the cap table. Now, because of our data, we can do compensation benchmarking better, faster, cheaper than anybody. Uh, and now I, I think, you know, it seems right now, cap table software and compensation benchmarking are like two different markets, completely different, you know, vendors and, you know, buyers and all this stuff. G give it three years. I think they will converge uh, and you'll get all your benchmarking from your cap table provider. That's uh, that's quite a journey, but but now as you explain, it makes makes a lot of sense. Maybe one last question from my side. Um, what is the number one lock-in kind of effect or tool which which helps Carter to keep their clients? Like basically, you, you said just a second ago, you're kind of eating also into the HR data and, and, and salary kind of data. But what's the number one thing which you think will keep clients on your platform? How do you lock them in on, on, on your marketplace? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, kind of tactical stuff, like if they're integrated into other systems, it creates more lock-in. If, 
if employees and investors know about it because they have all they're managing all their stuff, it, it creates more luck. And so there's a lot of kind of sort of tactical, you know, on the margin things that that can lock uh, customers in. But but I think at the end of the day, and this sounds trite and simplistic, but but you know when we look at our churn and contraction data, this is this is a you know 100 of what we focus on is if the com- customer is happy. Uh, they'll stay, and if they're not, they won't. Like no matter how, how difficult you make it for them to leave, if if you make if you piss them off, they're they're gonna leave. They will find a way, and so you got to keep them happy. And especially in sort of businesses like ours, where it's sort of mission critical, um, the number one thing uh, to to keep them happy uh, is you just have to get the numbers right. Like this is the like the most important thing. Like. The software has to be available when they need it, and it always has to be correct. And we do a lot of money movements, a lot of financial math, a lot of data stuff. And and as as long as all of that is rock solid, you know, it's it's true rock solid infrastructure uh, for them, uh, and they can rely on it. They'll be happy and they'll stay. Uh, and if at any point, you know, we lose credibility because we had a bug or something went wrong, or they had to call in for support because it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Then, then we risk losing them. And so all of our focus on keeping customers uh, is making sure that uh, we're, we're there for them and they can rely on us whenever they need us. Amazing. Cool. Maybe one random question. I had this one for quite a time and I wanted to ask it. What percentage of the portfolio companies of your investors you card or do you have kind of any any growth hack because like looking for example you have Andreessen Horowitz as as investor they have hundreds of portfolio companies and this is a juicy juicy market size for you so so can you can you share do you have data on that yeah totally so on average uh so if you look across all of um carta uh venture uh um because we have a lot of data on the on the through our fund administration business, we have a lot of data on what companies peop, um, investors are investing in and, and, and so on, and who's who's going to a Carta customer and, and what investments aren't going to a Carta customer. We think we have about 50% uh, of the market. Uh, so on average, if you look at a investor portfolio, you know we'll see anywhere from 30 to 70% of the portfolio is is on Carta, obviously averaging around around 50. Obviously some, some investors, skew more particularly investors of ours they'll skew more to 70 percent investors that you know don't know us as well or you know are a little bit outside of our sphere of influence might be lower on the 30 percent um but but on average about 50 percent uh, of investors uh, portfolios are in carta right now and we add you know we have about thirty thousand companies um we add about a thousand startups a month uh, to the platform that, that's really impressive Henry, thank you so much for, for these insights. It was a real, I think we, we covered all parts, maybe a bit uh, back and forth, but but uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, this was a cool, open and, and, and quick chat. Is there anything we we forgot to talk about or anything you want to share as like your ultimate recommendation to early stage founders to, to stay sane maybe? Because I mean, the, your company is insanely huge now and, and value, valued at the multi-billion a dollar any any last recommendation you have which which is a kind of keeping you up to up to speed yeah i guess my my last thought for early stage uh founders is um uh you know you do this thing about you know startups and and what's the difference between a startup and a small business and you know startup uh is designed to grow fast from the beginning and you know paul graham has this great essay about growth rates uh, called, I think Paul Graham, you know, it's called growth, I think. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just a maniacal focus on on growth rate for early stage founders. Like, how do you get the product to market and grow really quickly? Uh, nothing else matters. If you can get growth rates right, everything else uh, works out. And if you don't get growth rate right, nothing works out. Um, and so I, 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 that was one of the, the best pieces of advice I got as an early stage founder, and it, it served me well. Super nice, super valuable. Thank you so much. Greetings into the US. Your day is just starting. Uh, our day is uh, slowly wrapping up. This was the last session actually on this stage. I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully see you next year again at the Marketplace Conference.